this is just such an awesome outpouring of people and support and faces that I know and love and who have been there like since before I was born and my whole life and it's just really heartwarming. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I probably don't have to introduce myself to many of you, but I am going to just go, go through a little bit of my background and, and uh, give you an idea of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but first, I just want to thank uh, Summer Sessions, Gail Priday, uh, Michelle Bartlett for inviting me to do this. And also, uh, thank you, all of you, for being here. And um, I also just want to thank my partner, James, who has been a huge support and has really helped me do this work um, in a big way. So uh, yeah, my name is Clara Mache, as I mentioned. Um, I grew up in Fairbanks. I tried to go to school in Montana for a year and just missed this place so much. I missed the community. I missed the land. I missed everything about it. And so I decided to um, come back and go to school at UAF. Um, so I did earn an art degree at UAF, um, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Printmaking and in Painting. And um, I've been here ever since. I, I think some of you might have seen the article. I, this joke is going to get so old so fast. But I like to joke that I haven't gone very far in life because I literally live about 100 feet away from where I grew up. <laughs> so, so I think it does just really speak to how deeply connected I am to this community and how much I appreciate and love this place. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about my background. Well, um, I'm going to just get a little situated here. Can I hand that back to you? No problem at all. Can you all hear? And can you hear me OK? A little louder? I don't know if I do that or you do that. OK, awesome. Good, because I don't know how. Um, yeah, a couple other things. I'm going to rely on my notes. I'm definitely very forgetful, and I'm just like so floored by this outpouring of support that I'm going to need them more than ever. Um, but uh, I kind of jumped into my schooling. I just want to talk a little bit about my childhood. I was raised in the outdoors um, and also with parents who are incredibly supportive about um, pursuing art. And um, art has just always been a really natural extension of how I make sense of the world and how I communicate. And so um, the outdoors and art have long been these like really common or like strong threads in my life. Um, so to land where I am now, which is an artist who specializes in painting outside, I think is just, it couldn't have been any other way in some ways when, when you look back at it. So, um, and I just have to say a huge thanks also to um, Jim Brashear and also Igor Pasternak who were really supportive in like applying for the BFA and like encouraging me to go for, to school for art because I also was really interested in the sciences. I really liked geology. I really wanted to study rocks. Um, and so there was a time, there was a point in time where I was very seriously considering going to school for um, glaciology or for geology. Um, so I'm really grateful that I get to make art about rocks, as you'll see. Um, but that's, that's kind of a, a background about all of that. So let's get into it. I have a lot of slides to share. So I'm going to try not to talk too much. Um, so I'm going to share today a little bit about painting on location, so the outdoor painting process. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've started to integrate uh, science into my artistic practice, um, including collaborations with scientists. And then I'm going to share uh, just four recent projects uh, from the last two years that are, I think, good examples of um, that science art mindset um, and also that are addressing climate change in Alaska. Um, so. I'm going to talk about painting on location. So this is a great full circle moment, actually. So summer sessions was the first time I painted outside. In 2012, I took a class from David Mollett through summer sessions, spent three or four days out on the Yukon River, and got to paint outside. And it was this huge aha moment for me. Um, you know, finally doing this thing that I love to do in the place that I was most interested in painting. And it was just like a lightning bolt, really the biggest aha moment of my life. And I like to use this as an example. This is one of the paintings that I made. And it started raining, and I really wasn't prepared for the rain. And I ran back, and someone luckily had a garbage bag that they had their sleeping bag stuffed in that they gave to me. And I just like threw it over the painting. And I was sitting in the rain, and I was just covered in silt. And I was just as happy as can be, because it was this full immersion in place, and it was this very direct relationship with that landscape. And 
it just felt right. So this is the moment, this is a really pivotal moment for me where I was like, this is what I'm meant to be doing. I guess I should mention I also graduated school in 2012, and so I was sort of doing, huh, what, what do I do with this degree? Like, can I make it in the art world? And um, I just have to also give a shout out to Sarah Tabert, who at that time said, yeah, go for it. You, you, you've got it. Um, you, can, you can carve out a career. It won't be easy, but do it. So um, yeah, this was that time. So uh, 2012, gosh, it's been about, I can't do math, 12 or 13 years of painting outside. Um, and I've been really lucky in that time to be able to travel throughout the state to uh, remote areas throughout Alaska. Um, the little blue dots on this slide are just places that I've been for like more extended periods of time. I often do day trips as well. Uh, but these are all places that are off the road system, they're off trails. Um, and I'm gonna, the four that are circled are the places I'm gonna talk about later today. So, um, oops, wait a second. There we go. So how do I get to these places? Uh, it's a variety of different modes of transport and I just, I'm just gonna kinda go into some details about how I logistically paint outside on location and I'll talk a little bit more about materials later. But um, sometimes I take a bush flight, a small bush flight into a place uh, oftentimes it's hiking or skiing, and sometimes it's by kayak or uh, pack raft. And so I'm bringing all the materials to create art on location and the camping gear with me to, um, to go out into these places. And I think the other thing I wanted to mention too is sometimes I'm base camping, so sometimes I'm remaining in one place for maybe 5, 10, 14 days ideally, the longer the better. Um, and sometimes it's very quick, so it's, uh, you know, I might only make a smaller painting because I'm only going to be there for two or three days or maybe just for an overnight. And that helps determine, you know, the size of the canvas, it helps determine what materials I'm going to bring. Um, and so a good example of that is with the kayak here, I was just using watercolors because they're really small and, uh, you know, you can kind of get a sketch out in, you know, 20 minutes or so while you're rocking in the boat. So. Um, I wouldn't try and make an oil painting in that situation, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, these are the different modes of getting out there. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, too, is it takes about three to four days of 10 to 12 hour days to complete a, a painting on location. And I always strive to complete the work out there, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, if I can get 70 to 75 percent of the painting done, that's usually good enough that I can finish it back at home. So, safety is a huge thing uh, for me, and I actually uh, have a background in working in guiding um, as well, uh, wilderness guiding, uh, either backpacking, base camps, or river trips. And so I think about safety a lot, and I think that this is part of my, um, you know, integrating my outdoor skill set with the artistic skill set. And whether that's thinking about, you know, solo travel through bear brush while it's raining, <laughs> or making sure that I am roped up on a glacier and have a teammate that I trust if I'm you know, traveling on a snow-covered glacier, or if I'm wandering through you know, a recent wildfire and there's trees tipping over. Um, I think probably the biggest risk that I deal with or the biggest um, risk management I do is traveling in avalanche terrain and thinking about um, how to stay safe and select painting locations where I'm not gonna get swept off the side of the mountain. So. Um, all of these things feed into the artwork itself and inform the work and help me choose where I'm going to sit and make a painting. So. Um, weather, this is a big one. I get asked about this a lot. So uh, the first like five or six years of painting outside was really just about figuring out how to paint in all weather conditions because it's a little challenging. Um, and it's not just precipitation that's challenging, it's like the sun exposure that's challenging. I'm about as white as you get. So sun protection is really important for me. Um, learning, you know, learning what these different weather patterns mean for the snow or the ice and how that means you can move through the landscape or maybe not move through the landscape. Um, learning how to, I wish I had a laser pointer, but that pokey outy bit there is a painting that's actually wrapped in a tent tarp because I forgot a tarp because I just didn't even think about it. It was pouring down rain, so I just used the tent. Um, and now I'm fancier and I have a dedicated tarp for my painting. So it's this process of like adapting to the conditions, learning how to, how to plan for it, having those reliable systems. And honestly, the biggest challenge with weather now for me is 
if I can't see what I'm trying to paint. <laughs> so that does happen, and you just deal with it, and it is part of it. So, um, And self-care and staying warm, this is also something I get asked a lot about, is how do you stay warm when you're painting at you know, 20 or 30 below? Um, usually not painting at those temperatures, but when I do, it's all about eating food, staying hydrated. You all know this. I don't have to tell you. You live in Fairbanks. Um, but I just think that that's so important as part of being safe in the outdoors as well, uh, is taking good care of yourself, whether that's physically or also mentally too. I think those things are really important. So um, yeah, move in if you're cold. Let's see. Uh, let's talk a little bit about materials. So all the paintings um, that I do are rolled up for transport, so I go out with a blank canvas and I have wooden stretcher bars that it gets stapled to on location and then I pull the canvas off and collapse down those stretcher bars and um, hike out with it or ski out with it. So that's what that uh, far left photo is showing, that's how the painting gets transported. I do use oil paints um, because they're easier to deal with in the field. For starters, they don't freeze like acrylic paints. Um, they also are actually, believe it or not, a lot easier to manage in terms of wastewater. So I made this transition because I originally started out painting with acrylic paints, but that's actually microplastic that you then have to deal with a bunch of wastewater. And so with oil paint, I'm really able to um, pack everything out much more easily in a much smaller container, and I only have to use just a tiny, tiny bit of solvent. Sometimes I don't even use solvent. I'll use a sol uh, solvent-free safflower oil. Um, and, and so it's a great way to actually paint on location. So that was, oil paint is my medium of choice. Um, and when it's really cold, the paint does get stiff, so I just put it in my pockets on my body and keep it warm, so. Um, oh, and an important thing to mention. So the paintings get rolled up. You all might know oil paint, it does remain wet, so I use a medium, um, a, wall, a walnut alkyd dryer medium. It's just something you add to the paint to speed up that dry time. So you actually can roll it up. Um, and I do paint in very thin layers. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not applying like an inch of paint, as tempting as that might be sometimes. Um, so it does dry pretty fast. So, um, And then I just want to touch on ethics real quick, because I think this is really important, and this really informs my approach to landscape. Um, for starters, I am packing everything out that I bring in. I leave things in place that I find in the landscape. Um, I'm really conscious uh, that orange tarp here, this is to catch any paint drips so that I'm not leaving behind you know, a solvent or um, paint pigment in the landscape. This is just a funny time when I started pulling the staples out of the, of the stretcher bar, the back of the stretcher bar, and I thought I put them in my trash and I actually put them in my snack bag, so I was picking <laughs> staples out of my snack bag for the next week. Um, so I'm very dedicated to not leaving stuff behind. Um, and the other thing that's really important to me is creating in community. And this has become more important as I'm like seeking out collaborations and sharing these experiences with other people. So whether that's teaching for um, a program, this is actually Girls in the Forest. It's an inspiring girls expedition. I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, so teaching is really important. Sharing it with other people. Um, this is a really important part of what I do. It's not just a solo pursuit, and I'm not just trying to get to the top of the mountain. Um, so, oh, look, I made a slide. I forgot I made this slide. Creative community. I guess I kind of already covered that, but um, yeah, this is just a sampling from the last two years of people who I've been lucky to go out with and to learn from, and um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, except y'all are awesome, and I appreciate you. So I think the, maybe the other important part about this is that I'm doing a lot of thinking right now about the fact that I'm actually painting landscapes without people in them and thinking so much about how people impact landscapes and how we're so much a part of them. And so I just don't want to give the impression that like I'm out there just alone or like, I don't know. I don't, I don't quite know how to articulate that, but it's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, let's move on to art and science. So, I've started to really integrate uh, scientific thinking into my work more intentionally, probably in the last five or six years. Um, and that's really started because of seeing change in the landscape and being curious about why that change is occurring and wanting to know more about what climate change is and what it's, you know, how it's playing out in Alaska 
and just to be able to process that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've done that. So it is a way to process change. Um, that's pretty basic, but I think that it's really important. It creates space for me to be able to sit in a place, be with it for an extended period of time. Usually we're just moving through a landscape, like whether we're on a river trip or we're berry picking or whatever it might be, like we're always moving. This gives me a chance to sit in that place and really feel it and listen to it. Um, and it's a way of looking, you know, for answers. It's like, uh, maybe not answers, but understandings. It's a way to um, try and find deeper understandings for these vast, huge, abstract processes that are acting upon these landscapes. Or I don't know how to really talk about this. I'm, I'm trying to get better, but like, kind of those things that you're, you're thinking about in these places that are kind of heavy and kind of big and just hard to wrap your mind around. And, and art is a way to make that concrete and, and to make it an object that you can kind of wrap your head around. I'm getting a little out there, sorry. I'll, I'll try and explain that a little better later. There's gonna be better opportunities further on. So um, I just want to, I want to speak to our interconnectivity and our place here and our time. Um, I think that art and science have been well established as sort of these parallel or very complementary um, lenses with which to view the world. They're rooted in curiosity and questioning and experimentation. They're kind of these very similar ways of knowing, um, but also very different. Um, and so this is just a cool example of like how you can use visuals to maybe communicate something about uh, the shape of a glacier. You can use a diagram or a map to like represent an abstract idea. And I'm just trying to take it a couple steps more towards art than the science and paint about science instead of making art. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm, I'm struggling. I need to take a deep breath. Um, I think it's important to make art that uses science as an inspiration, not necessarily to make art that is only communicating science. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm seeing heads being nodded, good. I also make art because I am not always good at saying things out loud. Um, <laughs> and uh, I guess the last thing I wanna say about this is that I think, um, you know, I just wanna acknowledge that these are only two perspectives and there are so many ways of knowing a place and these are just the ones that I'm most attracted to and like, you know, what I'm naturally interested in. So it's just important to keep that, keep that in the back of the mind. Um, collaboration has come, become really important. I just can't help but share this diagram. This is a really useful framework. Maybe some of you are already familiar with it. Um, this is from Mary Beth Lee, uh, who is a, a researcher up here at UAF. Um, so I've started to really intentionally collaborate with other artists, writers, and scientists to sort of explore these ideas uh, about climate change more intentionally and trying to move towards a more um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach. So basically on the far, far left, if you imagine that circle, that line as a problem or an idea or an issue, those little dots are different disciplines working on that, working on that prog problem. And if we are starting to work more and more together, this is like we're transcending those, those disciplinary boundaries and um, we're sharing knowledge and skills, we have equal decision-making power, and there's an inclusion of all stakeholders. And I think it's really important, especially with climate change, to move towards this transdisciplinary approach because one discipline is not gonna solve it, right? We have to work together. And you know, we can all wear many different hats, like some of us might be interdisciplinary by nature, we're wearing like, for example, when I'm skiing out into a landscape, I'm looking at the, the shape of the snow and the shadows and I'm, I'm using my mountaineering lens to say, oh, that's maybe not a safe slope. And then I'm using my, this is an interdisciplinary approach to landscape, um, to, to think about these things from a variety of different perspectives. Um, so you can wear many hats, you can meet other people who are wearing many hats and this is how we're gonna solve problems is by working together, so uh, that's cool. Okay, oh, I kind of already touched on this. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I threw this up here. This is kind of, this is gonna be a doozy. I'm gonna try my best. Um, art informed by science. This diagram really kind of changed perspective for me. So this is from Michelle Mack um, with Bonanza Creek LTER. I saw a presentation that she gave through the In a Time of Change program. And you can probably just ignore the questions. These are pretty specific questions about the boreal forest. 
it's this framework that has really informed my thinking in my art practice. And basically, it's looking to the past to understand where we are now, thinking about the future to understand where we're going to be, and how time is not actually very linear. It's this very circular, cyclical, interacting force. And we see that in climate. We see decisions that were made 100 years ago impacting the way landscapes are now. And likewise, the decisions we are all making now are impacting future landscapes. So it's this interconnectivity of time that has given me this whole, like, oh, new framework to understand how we can even start to respond to climate change. Because it, it's not just making decisions for the present, it's making decisions for the future. Does that make sense? Yes. OK, good. Good, good, good. OK. The other thing that I want to point out here is that um, when I talk about the past, I often use the word legacies. Uh, this is, I'm totally stealing this from scientists. Um, and when I'm talking about the future, I will often say future trajectories or trajectories, possible pathways. Um, and I really like that language to think about, think about time. Um, yeah, ground truth, okay. Um, this is the last thing I'll say about art and science, and I have totally stolen this idea from science as well. This idea of ground truthing, um, so ground truthing in, in a scientific sense is going out to a place, so a lot of climate data, a lot of climate science is actually done geospatially. It's satellite imaging, it's people at computers crunching numbers. A lot of the science isn't happening in the place. And sometimes scientists will send out people or instrumentation to go ground truth that data. It just means to say, okay, yeah, our data checks out. Like, the satellite says a tree is here, we're gonna go over there and we're gonna say, okay, yeah, there's a tree here, our, our data's correct, our, we're all calibrated, we're all good to go. And what I've been really interested in doing is taking this a couple steps further and adding an emotional layer to that ground truthing, to actually be there in that place, experiencing it on an emotional level as a human and adding that piece to the story. And I just love that idea of, um, of ground truth, that that we, we can go out and be immersed in that place and learn from it. Um, and yeah, so I think, I think I can move on. Ground truth. All right, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna get into recent projects. So this uh, is a project, okay, right. I gotta gather my thoughts, sorry y'all. This was two years ago. I'm lost in time. I talk about how time is cyclical, and I thought we were in June earlier today, and I realize we're in July, so I don't know where I am in time. Um, this was two years ago. So this is up in the Aragech. Um, this was a project that I was invited out on um, to go create art about advancing tree line and vegetation in the Brooks Range. So one of the things we're seeing with climate change is that vegetation is getting thicker, brushier. Um, certain species are starting to move north, and the tundra is actually starting to turn into a boreal forest in places. Um, and so this was a project by Roman Dial. Um, he had also invited David Cooper, who's an ecologist who was out there 40 years ago to actually return to the place and see how it's changed. And um, I was also out there with fellow artists Julia Ditto and Bill Brody. Um, and huge thanks to Michelle Bartlett, the Explorers Club and Discovery for funding, funding this trip. So, we went out for two weeks. We were uh, basically base camping. We hiked in about seven miles, and I produced three or four paintings while I was out there um, looking, at, looking at the trees in the area. But first, I had to paint the rocks. This is the first painting I made. I couldn't help myself. It's, look at that. Look at those amazing mountains. Um, so this is the first painting I worked on. We were there right before green up. Here's the finished painting. Um, so you can see that there's no leaves on the, the branches of the willows yet. Um, you might be able to see I did, just for Roman, put <laughs> one tiny little spruce sapling that was there, it was there, I didn't make it up. But um, I told him, see, see, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing the work. Um, this is just the, the, furthest, uh, the furthest, the highest elevation tree in that area there. Um, but then, uh-oh, not going to the next slide. But then I got to, I got to work on, on the second painting and really started to think about how trees are changing in this area. And um, I just wanted to show an example of my sketchbook. So I'm not always just jumping right onto the canvas. I'm often doing little studies in my sketchbook. 
um, observational practice, you know, really paying attention to, um, you know, even getting down and counting the nodes on the mountain heather here. Um, so it's, it's kind of a scientific sketchbook practice. Um, and what did I want to say about this? This was, this was actually really cool. I was making this painting. You can see where it was set up. I loved this stump here. And as I was working, these three, that's David Cooper there in the blue hat, started working their way up the hill, and they were actually collecting science out there. So my, I, I should back up. My role was to just make art. There were also scientists doing their science thing. Um, and this is their science thing. They're going up and they're counting all the little tiny spruce saplings um, and, you know, on a transect. So they're walking up this hill and they're carefully counting and measuring every little spruce sapling. And it was really cool because David remarked that the stump that I was painting and that I was so visually intrigued by and interested in was likely the grandmother tree for a lot of these other trees in the area. So this was probably one of the first trees 40 to 100 years ago that was in that area. And it was just kind of this, oh, that's so cool. This is where when artists and scientists worked together, suddenly my whole view just shifted. And I was able to see what the landscape might have looked like 40 years ago or 40 years into the future just because of that one comment. So um, that was pretty neat. And there's the, the finished piece. I had to do all the mountain heather at home. I didn't quite finish it out there. So, Moving on to fire. Um, I see a few of you in here who study fire. So I'm um, really interested in wildland fires and how they are changing with climate change. Um, they're a normal and healthy part of the boreal ecosystem. Most boreal forests burn every 100 to 150 years. That's just the natural cycle of the boreal forest. Um, but what we're seeing with climate change is that they're increasing in severity. Um, we are having a longer fire season and um, more acres are being burned, more and more trees. So uh, these, are the, these are the changes we're seeing in Alaska and also you know, elsewhere in the world. And it's impacting um, carbon cycles, uh, permafrost melt. There's a lot of implications. Even glaciers, believe it or not, are actually responding to the amount of ash that gets onto a glacier surface and actually can make it melt faster. So all of these processes are interconnected. Um, so a lot of implications for, for changes with wildland fire in Alaska. Um, and really, this is a collection of a lot of different projects. So this is not really one project. Um, I just, you know, these are all the scientists that I've worked with. Um, the, this uh, project was uh, funded by a career opportunity grant from the Alaska State Council on the Arts and also the Puffin Foundation. Um, and, and I'm just going to jump into the work because I think it'll make a little bit more sense. But these are all the people who are helping make this happen. Um, so this is a piece called Future Legacies. Some of you might know the Yankovic uh, fire that occurred. I think it was just two years ago. Yeah, it would have been 2021. Um, it's just right out, uh, it's like really close to UAF. And I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty neat. So I. Uh, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Let me back up for a second. At the same time that this fire happened, I was in a program called In a Time of Change. It's a art, science, humanities program that UAF um, hosts, and it brings artists and scientists together. And so we actually took a field trip out to the Yankovic fire. This, this, I feel like the backstory helps, helps place us here. Um, and, and it was through that field trip that I learned about vegetation plots. And I thought, oh, cool, it would be really interesting to actually use the tools of science, this meter by meter plot that the scientists are using to look at those vegetation changes post fire. So they're, they're curious what's coming back, how fast is it coming back, what species are coming back, and they're tracking that change over time. So they'll actually like GPS mark these points and they're very like exacting about returning year after year to see what, what happens after a fire. I was like, oh, that, that would be so cool. So, um, this is a meter by meter painting. The painting's on the right. I, th I think that's obvious. I just realized it looks more realistic than I intended it to, but um, <laughs> that is a painting. <laughs> um, and that is the plot. That's not a painting. Um, so this is the first time in my art practice where I actually borrowed the physical tools of science to talk about transformation and change in the landscape. Um, and 
again, I just wanted to return to this place again and again and kind of build that relationship with the place, build an understanding of what changes were occurring, whether they were seasonal, climate related, you know, just paying attention to what critters were coming back and using, using the area or in the area. Um, critters don't really use the area, they're just immersed in the area. That's not the right word, but, um, you know, going back and, and practicing being in this place. So, um, let's see. I want to just look at my notes real quick. Yeah, I, I have written here, and I think this is important, you know, even in the relative stillness of the winter, this place is moving and changing. More so than we realize, especially in the snowpack, especially in the soils. The microbes are active even in the winter. Permafrost is either being insulated or built up. Like, there's so much happening that we can't see. Um, and so that's, that's why I wanted to go paint this place in the winter. Um, and here are some of the finished pieces. I just really also love those really simplified forms. Um, I think this is why I like rocks so much. They're kind of the bones of the landscape, and I feel like fires kind of do to trees what I love about rocks, if that makes sense. Like, um, they're just gorgeous. So there's also an element of just being very attracted to it aesthetically. Um, so those were the paintings that came out of that. ITOC, in a time of change, sorry, acronyms. Scientists are the worst, but I catch myself sometimes with acronyms. Um, in a time of change connected me with a writer, uh, Debbie Motoro, who I then collaborated with on a, a series of pieces. This is just one of the ones we did. Um, and so this is actually a tree from the Yankovic fire on the left-hand side, and then a tree from near her home in Denali that probably burned about 100 years ago. Um, both trees are still standing. Debbie and I just really connected on a lot of levels. We both love the mountains. We both love skiing. Um, we just really hit it off. But we were also both processing the loss of a friend at this time. And so this project was a really important way to deal with grief and loss on a personal level. And it added this whole other layer of sort of ecological loss or ecological grief or climate grief. And I think it's important to talk about that because and, and hold space for grief, right? Because that is a very strong emotion. It, it sometimes is not so fun to sit with, but that's like how we make change, right? Like that can be a source of change. And so it is a powerful emotion. Um, and so that's something I think a lot about when talking about climate change, because I think it's important to maintain hope and we don't want to get to a point where we're just not taking any action, but I think grief is actually very powerful. Um, Loss is very powerful, so it makes you pay attention. Um, let's see. This is also an important piece because it's one of the, the first times I really started to use or expand on um, sort of abstract features in the background there. So I'm no longer painting from observation. I'm actually using these other symbols to sort of talk about permafrost layers or these um, maybe what the landscape looked like before the fire happened, or what it looks like 10 feet underground, or you know the, the interactions of things I don't even know what they are, but like these things that we can't see. And so I'm trying to speak to that, like all those processes that we don't even know. We don't even, like science doesn't even know everything, right? Like there is so much we don't know. Um, so trying to find visual language for that, because I think that's, yeah, it's just, it, it's what pulls me into a landscape. Um, and ah, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and so these are, these are two pieces that are dealing with um, ideas of feedback cycles. So feedback cycles are something that are talked about in um, carbon cycling and climate change uh, research, especially in relation to fires. Um, so uh, feedback cycle is just talking about um, uh, an, a balancing or an unbalancing of an ecosystem. So, on the left-hand side, I have a wildfire here represented that is a well-balanced ecosystem. Trees are still upright. This is a healthy, a healthy fire. Um, the piece on the left is a unbalanced, or a, it's called a positive feedback cycle. It's, it doesn't make sense. I don't know who came up with that term. It's called a positive feedback cycle. It means it's an unbalancing of all these interactions. So the trees are knocked over. The, um, this is a really high severity fire. And really what I was trying to do with these two pieces is, is show that there are these, it's not a binary sort of thing, but it's like 
there is this balancing and unbalancing and we are on this kind of tipping point and it's like there's a darkness and a light and it's like really easy to make a really binary argument for like where we're headed with climate change but um, it was just a way to show visually this idea or this concept of feedback cycles um, which are pretty abstract um, does that make sense okay I, I'm seeing some like very thoughtful faces and I'm still practicing, honestly, I'm still practicing talking about the, the science. I read it and I read a lot of research papers and I take in as much as I can and I will reread it and I'll understand a little bit more and then I'll talk to a scientist friend and it's like, it's hard stuff to understand sometimes. So, um, you know, one of my goals with making work like this is that other people then don't have to go through the process of reading a research article from a scientist that's not really intended for the public to read. Like, it's intended for other scientists. So, um, so I'm still learning. <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to throw this one in there too. This is, um, I actually ended up cutting up some of the pieces that I painted in the winter of the Yankovic fire, but this is an attempt to show, um, back to that idea of past trajectories or or I'm sorry, um, past legacies or future trajectories. So specifically in the boreal forest, we have um, like when a, when a fire is higher severity, which is represented here, uh, when a fire is higher severity, you often get hardwoods coming back and um, birch trees because of the way the seeds are and the exposure of the soil is like mineral soil. And so birch actually have an easier, um, easier time coming into that landscape and growing. Um, versus a lower severity fire where you actually have a return to the, the conifer, to the spruce trees, the um, black spruce, white spruce. Um, and so this was just an attempt to show that when there's, um, I feel like, yeah, like, I'm trying to show that the ground didn't get totally down to mineral soil and what that might mean for the future landscape. And then likewise, what happens when it's all the way down to mineral soil and what that means for the future landscape. So this is, this is a piece, I, I made the two paintings as, as meter plots and then I didn't like how they looked and so then I cut them up and then I re-put them together and now I'm trying to figure out how to sew them together. So this is still like a total work in progress. Um, this is just a digital, I like stitched it together digitally to find out like if I would like it. Um, so. So this is definitely more experimental work. It's dealing with some pretty abstract stuff, but I wanted to share it because I think a lot of people um, know the work that I make that's much more sort of traditional landscape. So there's some weird stuff going on too. <laughs> um, all right, so two more projects to talk about. So um, last summer I was lucky to be a part of an artist in residence program called Voices of the Wilderness with the US Forest Service. And I was able to go visit Prince William Sound, I had never been. I've lived in Alaska my whole life, and um, I am a very interior girl. I have not spent much time on the ocean. So this was a really cool trip um, and a chance to uh, go paint outside for two weeks in Prince William Sound. So, um, of course, I couldn't just paint the landscape. I, had, I just immediately was thinking about um, how climate change is impacting this landscape. And it's pretty obvious when you start to look at the, the various landscapes, the fjords and the way they're shaped and the story that they're telling. So I was super curious. I knew that there had been a glacier basically everywhere where you can see water, probably pretty recently. And it wasn't until I was back in town that I learned it was basically as recently as um, 70 years ago. Wherever you see water was actually ice. Um, so that's big change. Yeah, that's fast change. Tidewater glaciers are, you know, they undergo these cycles of, of change and like we call it retreat and um, advance and they more than like glaciers that you would see in like the Alaska range that are in the mountains, tidewater glaciers are like really, they move a lot, um, but they're starting to move in one direction, a lot in one direction. Um, so yeah, I ended up titling this piece where the glacier was um, and I, purposely made it this kind of balanced, you know, you're not supposed to put the horizon line right in the middle, but I'm thinking about these tipping points and these balances and stuff. So I am playing with kind of the, what we, you know, learn the rules so you can break the rules, right? And I'm playing with that space of where the glacier was. And so you can actually see the glacier is retreated back up into this valley. It's the Nelly Wan Glacier. Um, 
Yeah. Oh boy. I feel like I'm a Debbie Downer, but I'm gonna read this to you. So, painting this view was a way to sit in this time and place, to feel it, to let it be big and daunting and very sad. Um, but it was also a way to show that change is constant, it's beautiful, and that there are many incredible examples of resilience that come along after change happens. So, I think one of the things also when we talk about climate change is like, it's an uncertainty. It's certain that it's gonna change, but it is an uncertainty. It could be a beautiful future. Like, there's power in that uncertainty too. I think we get really scared of uncertainty, but there's, there's a lot of potential there. And that's on, on us to, to make beautiful. And yeah, anyway. This was a really cool trip because I didn't really understand how tides work. So they kind of kicked my butt. I set up this painting, not realizing that the tide was coming up. So um, <laughs> talk about adding urgency to the work. Um, <laughs> that's as far as it got on the left there. Um, and actually, you can see the tide line. Um, but I love this as an example. Like, it, it is also just fun to be out there painting and to be like playing with the landscape and playing in the landscape and being immersed in it. and and just responding to the change, even when it's heavy, it's like, it's fun, it's really enjoyable. So, um, yeah, the tides. I learned about tides on this trip. Um, and I think, I think, too, the other thing to keep in mind is this trip really helped me realize that although I'm thinking a lot about climate change and I'm thinking about these, these big things, like, it all comes back to curiosity, and it all comes back to being curious about your surroundings, whether that's other people or the place. And, you know, yeah. Curiosity is so important. That's what keeps me going. Um, so, like, lean into your curiosity. If you're feeling, yeah, uncertain or, like, kind of daunted by the headlines, just lean into your curiosity about other people or other places or, or any of it. Like, that is, I think, that's what's gonna save us is curiosity and openness to whatever you find out. Um, and maybe your curiosity, like me, is, is this island gonna be here in 100 years? Because that's what I was thinking when I was painting this, is, you know, is sea level gonna rise? Is this ever, you know, probably not. And, and that's okay, islands come and go, glaciers come and go, that's all part of the natural process. We just need to understand our role in the change that's happening now, so. Um, this is the last project that I'm gonna talk about. This is very recent work, um, and uh, I'm not gonna share like all the, all the work in progress, but I just wanna talk about it because I am gonna be publishing a project website uh, sometime this fall or in the early winter. This is a place that is very near and dear to my heart, um, the Golcana Glacier down in the Alaska Range, and uh, I was really lucky to receive uh, support from the Rasmussen Foundation um, last summer to actually engage in a, what really has turned into more of a research project than an art project. Like, I didn't expect it to go that way, but that's really what it's turned into. And um, yeah, this is a place I have a really deep personal connection with, um, largely in part due to uh, instructing for Inspiring Girls Expeditions, as I mentioned earlier. This is a really cool uh, program that is here at UAF, um, bringing young women into the outdoors, and teaching art and science and self-empowerment in outdoor spaces. Um, and the Girls on Ice program is you know, part of that umbrella. And um, it's a program I've taught for, I think four or five times, maybe as a volunteer or as an instructor over the years. And we actually camp a number of times right next to this big rock. And you're gonna see this rock a lot in the next few slides, so that's why it's here. So it's this really personal connection with place. Um, and I also wanted to study the Volcano Glacier, not just because it's a personal landmark for measuring change, but because it's also one of five glaciers in North America that's being studied as a benchmark glacier. So there's a ton of data, there's a ton of uh, like historical archives, research photos, all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot to look at. And what I was really interested in was, again, if you can remember in your mind, going back to that idea of, um, uh, past legacies, future trajectories, I really wanted to take a step 100 years back in time and 100 years in the future and try and understand change just, just in like 200 years. And in the geologic time, that's not very much time at all. Like I actually really wanted to go back all the way to the like 
last ice age, but then I, you know, for the project, I was like, okay, I gotta think a little bit, <laughs> a little bit smaller. So like, let's take baby steps. Um, and actually, my friend Tyler Kirk said, oh, what you're doing is, you're doing a micro history. You're, you're, it's a micro history of place, and I love that idea, and that's what this has turned into. Um, so uh, this, I guess, sorry, I should explain these diagrams. So um, this is the Gulcano Glacier up here. This probably kind of explains itself. This is just describing how much um, the glacier has lost its, uh, its mass. So mass balance is just referring to like the amount of ice that the glacier has, how much it grew in the year and how much it lost in the year. Um, and so over the years since the 1960s, the Gulcano Glacier has been losing ice, a lot of it. It's gained a few years too, but not enough to make up for the loss. Um, so I knew all this going in, and so I was interested to really dive into that a little deeper. Um, these are some early paintings uh, just on the upper Gulcana that I did in actually 2019 before I really launched into this project. But the seeds of this idea had been planted long ago is kind of the point I'm trying to make. And this is actually showing a little bit more how I, I paint. So like kind of the bones are first, I like to think about the rocks first. Then I'm thinking about the snow and how it lays on top of the rock. Um, there's the painting where I was painting it. And this is the complete, complete painting. Um, and just one more painting from that trip. Um, and what was kind of interesting about this, this was in 2019. Um, the, the fern line, many of you probably already know this, but the fern line is the, like how far up the snow melts and it exposes the bare ice on a glacier. And the fern line was really high that summer. It was a really, really unseasonably warm summer for in this area for whatever reason. So the bare ice allowed me to actually access some of the higher areas of the glacier on my own without being roped up. So it's, it's interesting because it's like some of these changes, you know, that's what allowed me to get up there safely by myself is that it was a really hot summer and I could navigate on bare ice. So this is just kind of interesting to mention. Um, but again, just the, the, I think what I'm trying to communicate visually here is just that, that slumping or that loss or that flow or, you know, it, it's a bony landscape. There's not much ice. It's pretty thin. Um, so in 2020, I started a decade-long project um, painting that one um, very specific rock outcropping that uh, we camped by as a part of Girls on Ice. So I like to call this my personal landmark for climate change. You all probably have your own. Um, they're not hard to find. But um, this is the Gabriel Icefall on the left. And um, I wanted to start this project because, you know, after camping there over the last 10 years on and off, I was like, oh my gosh, that ice is going to be gone soon, this ice here. And I was like, it would be interesting to try and capture that change through a series of paintings. So I've been going out every September with my uh, husband, James, and we sit for three days and I paint that one view, um, the same size every time. Um, and here are, this is, okay, so this is 2020, so um, 2021 and 2022. And there's all three paintings together. Um, it's important to point out at this point, <laughs> this is where um, art can be kind of imperfect because I'm not trying to take a repeat photo. My hand is involved in the process. It's more about going and sitting with this place and seeing if that very obvious change is gonna happen in the next 10 years. And that's totally like an experiential based estimate, right? Like I'm just thinking to myself, that's what it's gonna do. It might not. Um, I think what this shows more is seasonal variability at this point. Um, you know, that there was more snow cover on the glacier in 2020, um, 2021, less snow cover. Um, and then in 2022, last year, we got totally dumped on by snow while we were out there painting. So um, I don't know what it says about climate yet. This is, this is work in progress. I, you know, it might say more about how I change as an artist and like how I render the landscape. Um, I'm not sure, but yeah, this is work in progress. I actually have the paintings here so we can pull those out if anyone wants to see them at the end. Um, but this is, again, all the seeds for this bigger investigation of this, of this place. So um, James actually found this really cool slide. Um, this is what started this whole interest in archival photos. This archival photo of 
that rock outcropping in 1959, 1960, they're not sure. Um, so most of you can probably connect. It's not an exact repeat photo, um, but you can see how much ice has gone away. Um, yeah. And so that just kind of gave this all a new sense of urgency. Um, I'm going to just skip this. Well, OK. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm about to go a little bit over, but I um, basically the idea here was to, I, well, I already talked about it. I wanted to paint backwards in times and forwards in time. Um, but to do that, I really had to do a lot of research. Um, so this is looking at some of those past legacies. We actually were really lucky. Um, Emily Baker with USGS, she's a geophysicist, sent me photos from 1910. Fred Moffat and USGS were out there in 1910 looking for gold. So lucky for me, I can use those photos now to understand how much this place has changed in the last 120 years. Um, so this is, this is the map. This is the Golcana Glacier here, kind of, you know, the edge of what they knew at that time. Um, oh boy. This is looking future. I'm, this is super cool, and I'm going to do my best to describe it because it's, it's some pretty wild stuff. Try not to get too bogged down with like, you know, the, the diagrams. This is some work that was sent to me by David Runes, who's a climate, um, well, he, he does climate modeling. So basically, he's a mathematician. He's a civil engineer. He's a mathematician. And he's using a bunch of different climate models to say what different landscapes, specifically glacier landscapes, might look like in 50 years or 100 years. And he's actually using um, these really, uh, what's called a socioeconomic um, pathway, which is basically, um, what are we as humans going to do to respond to climate change? How are we going to reduce our emissions? Like, are we going to be on, on the good path? Or, well, maybe not the good path, but like, are we going to get get it together and reduce fossil fuel reliance? Or are we going to descend into, you know, um, yeah, uh, not so great. <laughs> I don't, I'm not good at describing. There's, if you look up SSPs, it's actually really interesting because I think it's like scientists using stories of the future to really talk about what we need to do now. And it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. But um, basically, the only thing you need to pay attention to here, I'm going to just skip to this part, is actually this here. So this is a representation of the Golcana Glacier specifically and the amount of melt that we might expect to see in the next 40 years. So, um, and it's calibrated to those different models. Um, yes, we do get our act together and we start acting and we reduce our emissions and no, we do really bad and we just keep burning more fossil fuels. Um, this is kind of sad news because it doesn't matter what we do, the Golcana Glacier is going to be gone in 100 years. Um, this is showing a profile of the glacier. Um, there might be a little pocket of ice kind of at the toe because it's going to be debris covered and probably protected, but Gulcana is going to be gone. Um, and what was really shocking to me, you know, I was starting to wonder if this repeat painting series, I was like, maybe there's not as much change as I think there is. Sure enough, like, it drops pretty precipitously. Like, we're kind of at that, again, that tipping point, right? And, and once that change gets going, it ramps up and it, it happens fast. So it's very possible that in a decade, um, well, in 50 years, the gull candle will be gone, not 150. Um, so this gives a lot of new urgency to the work. <laughs> um, so that's the way you have to look at it, right? Um, so this is, uh, I just have like three or four more slides. This is a, a recent trip that James and I took to go use those 1910 photographs by Fred Moffat and actually take repeat photographs because I'm going to use them as reference for paintings imagining the future scenario. Um, and it was really fun. I've never gone to a place, you know, usually I'm picking like a painting location or I'm trying to get to a good campsite. It was very interesting to explore a place 
trying to position ourselves where someone else stood 120 years ago. It was a very different, wandering way through landscape. I saw this place that I know and love in totally different perspective. I mean, we're just all over trying to find, well, James is actually really good at finding the exact spot very quickly, um, so I was lucky to have him along. <laughs> um, but it was really fascinating to, to have that be the reason we went out. Um, and some of you might have seen, I, I did just share these photos. Um, this is actually just still a cell phone photo. I haven't stitched together the final high resolution versions. And this is uh, Fred Moffat's 1910. You can see pretty clearly where the glacier is and you can see pretty clearly where the glacier isn't. And there's my, there's my landmark that I've been painting. Um, so it's, it's big change. And you know, it's interesting. I've spent a lot of time out here or out in that place and feel like I know it pretty well. You know, I feel like I have this pretty deep personal understanding of it. And it was shocking, actually, I think I put a slide in. It was shocking to realize, like I know when I'm hiking up this valley what this means. I know that means that the ice was there. I, I just didn't realize until I saw that photo. And so this is the power of visuals. Like this is why we need these visuals to remind us of that. Um, yeah, so. This is my studio wall right now. Um, <laughs> it's been so fun to make, uh, to make this like, um, it just feels like a giant research. Actually, you know what it feels like? It feels like what I used to do for current events in Miss Hall's class in sixth grade. <laughs> That's what this is. That's what this is. Um, it's just a deep dive. It's absolutely a deep dive. Um, and it's been really cool. It's just completely enriched my understanding of this place. And, so many more questions. So um, I am going to try and get this, this website um, that will share all the paintings, all the final paintings and drawings from this project. Uh, we'll be out this fall or early winter, um, depending. But um, if I want to, I wanted to leave you with, with this, uh, this beautiful quote from Marcia. Fathoming, fathoming deep time is arguably geology's single greatest contribution to humanity. Just as the microscope and telescope extend our vision into spatial realms, once too minuscule or immense for us to see, geology provides a lens through which we can witness time in a way that transcends the limits of human experiences. Um, go hug a rock. <laughs>
space to sit with all the emotions at once so I can feel discouraged and hopeful at the same time. And so I think it's that capacity to sort of feel all the feelings, um, which sometimes kind of sucks, I'm gonna be honest. Like it's not, it's kind of exhausting, but like um, it's, it's, never, it's never only um, sadness. It's also curiosity. It's like I always have that to lean into. Um, so that for me is what brings me solace. Um, and oh, I just had a thought and I lost it. Uh, it'll come back to me. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Totally. And yeah, you've just, yeah, I think about this a lot. Like I, I felt for a long time very stuck in sort of the traditional way of representing landscape. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, sky, middle ground, foreground. But like it wasn't doing what I needed it to do in terms of communicating these ideas that, um, you know, that are kind of abstract. And that's where like the circles and like kind of some of those other layers are coming in. Um, and, and, um, and Caitlin's here. I just saw my friend Caitlin, who I haven't seen in so long. This is so exciting. Okay, hi, Caitlin. Um, <laughs> so, so, and actually, just to back up for a moment, you know, I really studied printmaking. I took one, um, one or two painting classes, and it was really just like three days with summer sessions, and then another three days the next summer with Bill Brody with summer sessions where I saw David Mollett and Bill Brody painting, and I was like, oh, that actually gave me more information than any other, like, I've had six days of instruction with painting, I feel like, because um, most of the painting classes, you don't really learn, you, you just do projects, whatever you want. It's not really taught. Like, I was never taught specifically how to paint a landscape. So, um, I feel like I'm rambling, but yeah, I think that um, you definitely have to break away from some of those traditional or like more traditional landscape views. Um, and I would love to take a, a class like color mixing is a science in and of itself. I'm not even gonna pretend to understand or know. I'm an intuitive color mixer and when it works, it works and when it doesn't, I know it's not and I just keep trying till it does. So um, yeah, did that answer your question? Okay, other questions? Yeah. Really what we have to work on, and something you addressed here, is the human value, mm. emotion, empathy, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Has that evolved for you over time as you tackled these projects? Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, initially painting outside was just sort of, oh, I remembered what I was going to say. Initially painting outside was really joyful. And I, I, I'll come back. I have something to say about joy, too, believe it or not. Um, so, <laughs> so when I first started painting outside, it was just, it, I felt it was kind of superficial, not in a bad way, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking super critically about the landscape or my work or how I was representing it. I think that that has been a progression absolutely over the last 10 years, partially in response to climate change, um, partially in response to just wanting to think critically about how we think about landscapes and starting to question some of the, you know, the things that I've, I've been taught, trying to unlearn some of the perspectives I've been taught about landscape or the histories of landscapes. And so, um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely been a progression. And I think that I've always had a lot of emotions, but I think that, um, with the art specifically, they, they have grown, and I think that creating art has grown my capacity for that emotional experience. Absolutely, actually, I'm just realizing as I'm saying it. Yeah, it definitely has. And it, and it has, it, like the Gulcana Glacier, I mean, I remember having a slight breakdown on the Gulcana Glacier because I was really sad about the change I was seeing, and then it was art that made me feel better about it. So um, I think the more and more I do that, it, it does grow that emotional, um, what would you call it? not emotional strength, but like resiliency maybe is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. 
And um, just real quick, I have to go back. So like, I, I wanted to share the things that I care about the most and that I'm the most excited about. Um, but there's so much other work that I'm doing that is like, I was really lucky. I went out um, and painted on the Cahiltna Glacier uh, earlier this summer. And my whole goal for going out there was not to talk about climate change, not to talk about science. It was to go out there to be with my friends and paint a rock that I have wanted to paint, like a specific rock, moonflower buttress on Baguia. Like that's why I was there, for the joy of interacting with that rock. So I definitely, you know, think it's important to balance some of the heavier stuff with some of the lighter stuff. Um, so joy is important. And you, yeah, you gotta practice joy along with the, the, uh, the other stuff. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Have you ever seen a painting rolling it up? You know, I haven't, no. Um, I did drop a painting once. Um, I was skiing out of the Camel Glacier and I had it attached to my backpack and I dropped it and we tried to go find it the next day. Um, we couldn't <laughs> because there was like a foot of extra snow. <laughs> James is laughing because we had like our, um, you know, big glacier probes out and like ski poles and we're like feeling through the snow for four <laughs> hours, sweeping, 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 where is this painting? And we never found it. And um, <laughs> um, luckily about a month and a half later, we had a friend out there and I, I kind of put the, you know, the call out, hey, you see a painting. Um, and he found it, it was on the side of the trail. So it melted out in the spring and um, luckily it was on Cordura fabric and so it wasn't even that damaged and I still have to finish it. I promised I'd finish it for him and I haven't yet, but, um, but I think he deserves it for finding it. So um, yeah, so no, I've never smudged one, but I've lost one, um, it came back. Yeah, any other questions? I might just roll out these paintings if folks want to kind of filter through or need to head out. Um, thank you again. You guys rock. <laughs>